Hello, welcome to Genealogy Coffee Break. My name is J.D. Arden. I'm one of the genealogy and reference librarians here at Center for Jewish History. Um, my colleagues include Moria Amit um, and other members of our reference staff that you'll be hearing from in the future. Today, I'm very excited to give a quick presentation to you on the topic of how you can be smart about gathering clues about languages, dialects, alphabets, alphabet systems when you are doing genealogy research. Um, as always, feel free throughout the presentation to write your comments and questions into the chat box. If we don't get to your question or your comment, um, which we almost always do during the broadcast itself, we will follow up after the broadcast, or you can always send us an email at any time at the email gi at cjh.org. GI like Genealogy Institute, CJH like Center for Jewish History. A quick note, if you or someone you know is a member of any kind of nonprofit community group, synagogue, school, any group interested in doing a Zoom workshop or um, question and answer information session, uh, doesn't have to be a large group, could be as small as about 10 people. Um, we on staff working remotely are happy to bring these Zoom presentations to you. You don't have to be Jewish. Your group doesn't have to be Jewish. Uh, we do a great basic genealogy starter session that's applicable to anyone. Uh, and we also now do workshops on topics such as how to care for and preserve old photos and documents that you might have. Um, so send us an email if you or someone you know would be interested. Uh, and let's start the presentation. So I'm going to mention um, a, a few sites. The few to keep in mind to start with are all three. Um, the first geneal genealogical translations is a Facebook group that um, you can join. It is useful if you have documents in a foreign language related to genealogy that you need either to identify the language or get a translation. Um, you can also do this for English language documents on deciphering genealogy script, another Facebook group. Um, if not on Facebook, then Viewmate on Jewish Gen it is a similar, similar forum. Um, there's some limits just to be nice about how many photos, uh, how many posts you can make a day. Um, but I want to teach everyone out there uh, from, give you some hints from my experience, what I've observed, how we can learn ourselves to be better at um, using the clues that we find in genealogy documents. Um, so I'll, I'll show quickly what those Facebook groups look like, and then um, I'll talk about Google Translate. So most of the rules are similar on uh, these similar groups. Um, if you make an external uh, image link of a high quality image, then you, the, what you upload to Facebook won't get reduced down and degraded in resolution. That's one tip. Um, and also to be nice, because people are voluntarily doing this work, um, don't take up more than one post a day. Um, you could use these uh, specific genealogy groups, such as Tracing the Tribe for Jewish Genealogy or any of the other um, ethnic or national groups uh, listed as examples on the side. Uh, many of them, uh, the members on the site, on the group page, will lend help 
in identifying languages. JewishGen.org under research is the link for ViewMate. And then ViewMate, you can upload a document, identify the language and get a translation. Um, but today, besides getting translations, we're talking about um, teaching ourselves to identify writing systems, alphabets, languages, um, especially in genealogy when we're dealing with people's names, then um, the name is just the name. Um, the, there's not necessarily a translation, but how the name is written can lend valuable clues that can help you in your genealogy work. Um, this is an interesting note. Uh, Google Translate app now on phone is an easy way to get um, instant translation of printed text. You can also type in various ways into the Google Translate website, translate.google.com. And if you didn't know, uh, besides text, you can also choose the option for documents and upload a document directly into Google Translate, which can save you a lot of time um, so that you don't have to type out the text that you're trying to translate or detect the language to identify the language. So there's one example. So um, now moving on to the content that, that will be interesting to think about, how a language is not the same as an alphabet. Um, we could talk about also how um, dialects might be grouped as a language, but um, use different writing systems. And we'll see some examples, especially in Jewish diaspora history, how um, as migrant populations move across borders where there are different writing systems, um, you can find a language written in more than one writing system, even if it's unofficially. So let's take a look. So here I've divided three of the main script categories that we might be dealing with um, for a lot of Jewish genealogy or other um, genealogy. Um, it's important to get a little bit uh, the common language of terms. So when I put here the heading Latin, uh, I mean the Latin alphabet, like we all know from using English, um, English language uses the Latin alphabet, um, Cyrillic, um, listed here are languages that use the Cyrillic script, um, which like the Latin alphabet exists with different letters or different um, variations to the letters for different, different alphabets, um, different languages. So like in the Latin alphabet, we might have English, French, Spanish, um, German, all have slightly different marks and dots, right? Cyrillic also uh, different letters or different markings on the letters for many of these. You can see already that um, there's some overlap or some cases where one language might officially use more than one script. And uh, finally on the right, Hebrew script, of course, used uh, for Hebrew language, also Aramaic, uh, which really you could consider uh, many languages or at least a, a range of dialects. Um, Judeo-Aramaic was part of the Jewish diaspora uh, language, even up until the 60s um, with the, um, the, the departure of Jews from the region of Kurdistan. Um, 
and a whole range of Jewish dialects of majority languages in different areas of uh, the diaspora outside Israel. So Judeo-Arabic, um, uh, Judeo-Persian, um, what's listed here as Judeo-Spanish, colloquially, colloquially known as uh, Ladino, um, and others, Yiddish, um, towards the bottom. So uh, it's helpful to note that if you have a document that looks to you like the Hebrew alphabet, um, either printed or in handwriting, it could be Hebrew. Um, technically, it could be Judeo-Aramaic uh, if it's from the, the region of Kurdistan. Um, it could be Judeo-Arabic. It could be Ladino. It could be Yiddish. So um, using your clues of where you know the document is coming from is a good start in identifying uh, the language that you're dealing with. Um, already also you can see that uh, Ladino, what we're calling Ladino, otherwise known officially as Spanyolit, um, can be written in the Hebrew script if the diaspora history that the document is coming from um, is in the Sephardic diaspora in um, what was Yugoslavia, parts of the Ottoman Empire, then certainly uh, Cyrillic alphabet could be used, right? You can write any language you want, more or less in any alphabet. So depending on education, it's very possible that um, migrant communities um, in different, different areas might use a writing system in certain circumstances that they're more familiar with or more used to. So um, there are examples in, in the US also of Ladino language newspapers that started printing uh, in the Hebrew alphabet and eventually switched to using the Latin alphabet because it was easier for printing and it became more familiar to the readership. So Ladino is one example of a language that in different circumstances could appear in all three of these scripts. Um, Russian is um, certainly one of the most familiar languages that uses a variation of the Cyrillic script, um, but um, not the only one. And I include Polish here also, because uh, sometimes because part of Poland for a while was occupied by the Russian Empire, and um, on, on the other hand, parts of present-day Belarus and Lithuania used to be part of the Kingdom of Poland. Um, there often is confusion about what the Polish language looks like. It's written in the Latin alphabet, just like uh, English has some squiggles and hooks around the letters, but um, it is recognizable even in handwriting. Uh, if you were looking through a document, you would recognize it as uh, the, the Latin alphabet, like English. Um, here are some of those hooks and, and dots that you can see. So I, um, I encourage all researchers and students not necessarily to try to learn an entire language just for your historical research or genealogy work, but um, it definitely can help you and help your skills to familiarize yourself with what the specific letters of a certain language look like compared to others. So as you can see in the example on the left, um, Polish has those hooks under the A and the E. It has a special um, slash that goes through the letter L. Uh, unlike any of the other alphabet systems, so that's a quick way you can scan through a document. And if you see any of those particular letters, then you know that 
you're dealing with Polish. Um, in a similar way, Romanian has those hooks under the S and the T. Um, unlike any of, of the other Eastern European languages. So, um, you know, it, it helps at least to get to know what are the letters particular to that language, um, especially if you're looking for documents in a country or area where that language was spoken or used administratively. Um, so that you get to know what you're looking for and how what the what the sounds are that um, each of those particular letters make, so that you don't miss anything. Um, we'll take a look at some examples in a second. Um, Cyrillic, you can see many languages there that use very variations of the Cyrillic alphabet. Um, so, in the the Russian Empire, officially Russian was used in administration. Um, once you get into um, Soviet Union period and uh, after the breakup of the Ottoman Empire and creation of the state of Yugoslavia, you get more um, language representation. But uh, it's good to know what you might be dealing with in different regions, could be any of those languages um, listed there. And Hebrew alphabet, finally on the right, I gave three examples. Uh, the top uh, bor uh, bordered in yellow, the newspaper there you see with a small inset uh, under the illustration written out also in Latin alphabet, La Luz, the um, Ladino or, or um, Judeo-Spanish or Spanolit language newspaper, La Luz, meaning the light. That, um, that newspaper was published here in New York City. Um, and uh, th there were many such uh, um, Ladino language newspapers. Um, you can browse all of these newspapers through the Historical Jewish Press portal. Um, on the website of the National Library of Israel. Uh, the second newspaper in the middle, um, many of you have heard of, uh, make a little comment if you have uh, grandparents who read uh, either a, a Ladino language newspaper or uh, as in the second example, Hebrew language newspaper, um, the Forverts, uh, is well known, uh, still online, although now only in English, um, but a very significant um, historical newspaper. And the last example um, to, to round out the group with a Hebrew language uh, newspaper um, from the 19th century, so uh, even before um, the modern state of Israel. We have Hamagid. That newspaper was published um, and distributed in various parts of Poland, Austria, and um, Germany, uh, or I should say Prussia and Austro-Hungarian Empire, but where those countries are today. Um, you can read the uh, Subheading, if you speak Hebrew, Hadashot Vekorot Hayamim, to modern Israeli Hebrew speakers. Um, some of those terms are very old fashioned. Uh, and uh, if, if you're a, a fan of researching languages, uh, it's interesting also to imagine that uh, before standardization of Hebrew uh, and in the period of Ashkenazi Hebrew speakers, uh, probably a Hebrew reader would have pronounced it as Hadashot Vekoros Hayamim. Anyway, uh, all of those you can check out and browse for free uh, on our colleague institutional site, uh, NLI. 
Uh, if you remember one thing today, this is what I hope uh, sticks in your head. Cyrillic is not a language. Very often in the library, um, I, I'm happy to get emails and, and uh, answer questions. But when someone writes in and says, is there someone there who can translate Cyrillic? Um, I can guess that what they mean probably is Russian, but um, it, it doesn't help me point them in the right direction um, just by saying Cyrillic. Uh, as we saw in this photo, variations of what's called the Cyrillic alphabet, really the Cyrillic alphabets, uh, derived from Slavonic. It could be Macedonian, it could be Serbian, it could be Bulgarian, it could be somebody who was living uh, in Macedonia who wrote Ladino in the Cyrillic alphabet. So uh, there's really a, a broad range of languages uh, that it helps to identify if you see a document uh, that's in a Cyrillic alphabet, um, go a little bit further, uh, either using a Facebook group or Google Translate or by doing some research, uh, looking at the particular letters or finding at least one word to translate so that you can identify the language um, and not just Cyrillic, the system of alphabets. That will help you and um, get you further in your research. So quickly, some online resources free that you can use if, if you want to input a text from a document you have, um, type it. You can see has a, a lot of alphabet sets that you can use to type something into a computer. Google Translate, of course, is great. Um, and you can also use the interface to upload a document. You could use it on your phone and take a picture. Um, uh, and you have options also on Google Translate of typing out a word phonetically like it would be represented in English. And Google Translate will switch it into uh, the alphabet. Um, certainly for Hebrew, that, uh, that's a helpful option to save time. Or if you don't want, if you don't know how to touch type on a keyboard, it saves you the time of clicking through that on-screen keyboard. Um, handwriting is a, maybe the most difficult uh, skill that we in genealogy research uh, helping you uh, can offer. Messy handwriting is always a pain. Um, how people wrote words with inconsistent spelling. Uh, there are a, a few helpful online tools you can use, uh, most notably on the website stevemorse.org. Um, if you don't really speak Russian, you don't have to learn everything about Russian, but it can help you tremendously if you learn some of the basics of the alphabet. You can use this um, cursive uh, generator. So if you're looking for the name Moshe there in the bottom, um, you can see what it looks like in handwriting, right? In most cases in the Russian empire, genealogy documents you might be dealing with are going to be handwritten. Um, so you can see at least what it would look like. And this can save you time if you're glancing through lots of pages and you want to be able to identify, okay, there's Moshe. Um, uh, and uh, also uh, parallel to that, Hebrew alphabet generator, same name, Moshe, um, in handwriting there. So if, if you never learned Hebrew alphabet or you're kind of rusty on the handwriting, this is a good tool to use to have something in front of your eyes so uh, that you give yourself a leg up uh, in your genealogy research and save time. Uh, let's talk about names. So besides words, right, that, that can be translated, names might be represented phonetically uh, in different alphabet systems. 
of different languages in different ways that can often confuse us. Um, but it can help you tremendously, like in the example here, um, Berkowitz, right? Or uh, maybe pronounced Berkovich. In all of these examples, in all of these languages, exactly the same last name. So absolutely, if, if different branches of your family went in different directions and had documents produced at different times by different countries, um, straight down the list, uh, every one of these spellings represents exactly the same name. Uh, and with the exception of uh, the, the Hebrew, Yiddish, uh, and German uh, version of Berkowitz with the TZ sound at the end, uh, all of the others, Polish, Russian, uh, Romanian, Hungarian, all pronounced Berkovich. Um, the, the one that is most tricky, or the two that are most tricky are Hungarian and Romanian. Um, to, often to us modern English speakers, um, the Romanian looks like we might expect it to be pronounced Berkoviki or Berkovic see uh, something like that. That CI in Romanian, same as in Italian, is their way of representing the CH sound. Uh, uh, also in Hungarian, represented as CZ. So both of those alphabet systems um, obviously don't write CH for the sound CH, but uh, Berkovich and Berkovich is how uh, those names would be pronounced. So uh, if you were looking for a Berkovich or Berkovich family member, um, then what I hope is helpful to you from this example is to see that um, these spelling variations might be results that you would otherwise miss. Uh, same thing briefly, the, the, bot, the first name at the bottom example, Shlomo. Um, a lot of ways to, smell, to spell Shlomo. Um, SZ in Polish is the equivalent of how we would write the sound SH. Uh, so whether for that name or another name, um, teach yourself a little bit the basics of how different languages would write different sounds and you won't miss any clues. Um, to move to an, a very different example, just for a change for a second, um, here is a train ticket from the Ottoman Empire period um, of uh, uh, the land of Israel. Um, so the language on the bottom might look at first like Arabic. It's written in the Arabic alphabet. Um, if you learn at least to transliterate and figure out the letter sounds, you would see uh, make a transliteration like I have here, um, which gives you the clue that it's not at all Arabic, but Ottoman Turkish. So. Um, Many uh, in in uh, in helping genealogy researchers, very often um, people may have wasted time uh, assuming that a document that is written in the Arabic alphabet, um, produced uh, in Ottoman era Israel, is in Arabic, but um, the administrative language of the Ottoman Empire was Ottoman Turkish. Uh, so most administrative documents, genealogy documents that you find from that time are going to be in Turkish. So you'll save yourself time um, by 
finding someone or uh, transliterating into uh, a Google Translate using Turkish, uh, modern Turkish written in the Latin alphabet, uh, not Arabic. So back to fun with last names. Here again is a list of how not to get tripped up. Uh, you could imagine one family going in different directions, um, in different places. Sugarman, right? If in America it was easy to anglicize uh, Zuckerman, in German, same pronunciation spelled a little differently. Polish also Zuckerman. Same in Romanian, Zuckerman, with that little hook under the T. Um, it could be, uh, especially in the Soviet Union, for reasons of social pressure to Russianize last names, that uh, Sugarman could have been translated into a, a Russian name, Sakharov, um, like the, the famous physicist. So um, either in different sound versions in different alphabets or sometimes in a translation or a local language version of a name, you might um, find connections between uh, the names that you're researching. Um, I want to talk a little bit again about the ch sound and how it can lend clues to genealogy research uh, because it's not an innately native sound to uh, original Jewish language or languages, Hebrew and then Judeo-Aramaic um, before the, the diaspora out of Israel spread to different language groups. Uh, even in the diaspora, even up until the 20th century, uh, there was still a, a lack of representation of the ch sound, even in Jewish diaspora languages. Um, and this can give you clues about time periods when people were in different places, um, whether uh, the Jewish population had integrated formal educational access to the uh, majority language. So uh, with a word like blintzes in the U.S., where a lot of the Jewish immigration was very early in the 20th century or before the 20th century, compared to, for example, in Israel, where um, most of the, the immigration was after uh, World War II uh, in the case of bringing words like that. Uh, in America, we say blintzes. In Israel, people say blinches with the, the CH sound. Um, it could also give you a clue, for example, if you find a document where there's, or, or a set of documents differentiating Berkowitz, versus Berkovich. Um, once uh, f f the Jewish population is more integrated uh, into speaking Russian and into documentation in the Soviet Union, then you'll find almost exclusively Berkovich in the Russian way as opposed to Berkovich uh, in the um, Yiddish or Jewish language way. Um, other side notes, as um, uh, Jews from Arabic-speaking countries um, fled those countries and brought um, Judeo-Arabic dialect, um, you also have the historical traces of um, what was identifiably the Jewish accent uh, of Arabic that that could have been immediately identified. Same with uh, pronunciation of R's. Um, in the CJH building uh, that includes Yuval archives, we worked for a long time with a wonderful archivist, 
named Marek Webb, who still pronounced everything with that guttural R, um, Marek, uh, even though he also was a, a Polish speaker, uh, which usually would have the rolled R. Um, so that is, was a nice example of how um, Jews who didn't receive a primary education in Polish or Russian first still maintained um, what would have been the Yiddish accent in the, the pronunciation of R. Uh, so different time periods have uh, different clues either in the writing, uh, spelling, or pronunciation that can be interesting to think about. So I hope that this gave you a lot yourselves to think about. Again, um, write us in the comments here, write us an email, giitchh.org. If you want to uh, recommend us to a community group for a Zoom session, we're always happy to do them. And we'll see you next week online for another genealogy coffee break. Take care.